Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study again. I hope that you have the Word with you. It is our shield. It is our guide. It is our compass. Tonight, I want you to take the book of Proverbs, if you will, and if you will turn there, we're going to be looking at a particular scripture or scriptures in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. I'm going to entitle this study, The Way of Wisdom. The Way of Wisdom. Wisdom, what is it? Well, it's much more than knowledge. You see, there's a difference. Someone has said that the great difference between wisdom and knowledge is a very big one. It's the difference between a lightning bug and a lightning bolt. Now, wisdom is facts and ability uh, being co correctly applied. It's not enough to just have facts and knowledge. It has to be correctly applied. It's kind of like the man, and I've used the illustration before, but it sure makes the point. The illustration of a man who had been reading the statistics, uh, and he read that most accidents happen within two miles of home. So what does he do? He decides to move. Well, he's got the facts right, but the action was wrong. And we have to be very careful and look at what the Bible says the real way of wisdom is. And so we go to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is a book all about wisdom. The book of Proverbs is a very good manual for life. It is a good business manual. It's a good spiritual manual. It's a good guide for us. Billy Graham said for a long time, he said, for years and years and years, I have committed myself to reading one chapter of Proverbs a day. One chapter of Proverbs a day. And you can work through the book very quickly that way. But there's so much wisdom that we need to hear. Now, the passage that we're looking at tonight comes uh, in a first vision of the book of Proverbs. From chapters 1 through chapter 9. And it means very simply, uh, the whole book is, or chapters are described with a description of wisdom. What wisdom looks like. Wisdom is personified here. It is as if a person, or wisdom is alive and is a person and is talking to us. Now this will be fulfilled not just by types and shadows, but by the reality of the coming of Jesus. For all wisdom is found in him. And so we go tonight to Proverbs chapter 4. If you will, take the word, and I want us to begin reading chapter 4 in Proverbs. And I want to begin reading in verse 20. I'll give you just a moment to turn there. And I always say, don't ever let any man preach to you or teach to you without the word of God being open. Because the Holy Spirit is going to teach us from the word of God and by the word of God. Anything less than that is an error on our part. The same with the preacher using the word of God. So Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all of their body. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Now I want us to look at these first three verses today, and next week we'll go further. But the first thing that I think that catches our attention, if we let the word speak for itself, is we are given a command and a call to hear. That's exactly what is said in verse 20. My son, Give attention to my words. In other words, listen to what I'm saying. Notice, pay attention, incline your ear to my sayings. And so we have been given a command to hear. A call to hear requires what? In order to obey this command, we have to have a consecrated ear. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean very simply that our ears have to be attuned to listening to God listening to God, letting the Spirit speak from His Word. And it is a call to the heart to hear. Now, when you go to the Old Testament, the heart is often that which 
represents the source and the seed of our emotions, our actions, our attitudes. You see, it's not just about out outward life. Proverbs is not just saying, well, you know, act this way and act that way. It goes much deeper than that. It goes to the root cause of our actions. It's not just talking about actions. It's talking the outward life, but it's talking about the inward life, our attitudes. And you see, our, our actions, rather, come from our attitudes. And so, listen again to what it says in Proverbs 4.22. For they are life to those who find them, and health to all of their body. In other words, the Bible is saying we ought to have a boundary for our ears. Boundaries are blessings. I've talked about it often. You take the bark off a tree, it dies. A person gets severe burns, their skin is uh, burnt, and they die. And so burdens don't come from boundaries. Burdens come from trying to break the boundaries. Now, God's word is a commandment. It's a commandment about us heeding him. And the Bible says that when you heed the word of God, when I heed the word of God, when we heed the word of God, that doesn't mean hear. It means listen and put into place and obey. And it is health to us then. That means total wholeness is the idea. And it is a command for us to keep the word of God. Again, do not let them depart from your sight. Give attention to my words. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Now, we have a command to keep God's word. But when God commands us something, here you are. He also tells us what the consequences from that will be if we're obedient to him or disobedient to him. Verse 22, for they are life to those who find them and health to all of their body. And now we have the word of God telling us and God telling us, listen, listen to wisdom because it will give you quality of life and quantity of life. Quality of life and quantity of life. Quantity of life, we're talking about length. But you see, everything doesn't hinge upon the length of life. But quality of life, that's everything. And it comes from heeding the Word of God. You see, our Creator has given us instructions as the creature. Have you ever had the manufacturer's instructions? and you throw them aside. Maybe it's a piece of playground equipment. Maybe it's something else. I've done it before, and how foolish I was to just throw those instructions away and think, well, I know this. I have enough knowledge. I can figure this out. Only to have to go back and dig out the instructions. And when life fails, that, that's what we have to do. And to keep life from failing, that's what we have to do. We have to go to the Word of God and receive our instruction from God. It's not the instruction of a preacher unless the preacher is dealing and allowing the Word of God to deal with him and then accurately presenting the Word of God. It is us not just reading the Word of God but applying the Word of God. And for us to ignore the instructions is to ensure, guarantee that we will have problems. And so God's saying, Here's a warning. As the creator, I'm giving my creatures how to live. And it's important that you do not dismiss those and throw those away. And so, we're to hold on to wisdom as a child holds on to its mother's hand and receives guidance. That's why we are to incline our ear. When it says, my son, give attention to my words. How can we give attention unless we incline our ear and consecrate it to make sure that we're committed to hear the word of God? RCA Victor, for years and years and years, their label carried the picture of a dog there. The dog's name was Nipper. And here he is sitting down, and he's sitting in front of a gramophone, and his head is cocked and his ears are perked, and he's listening to something intently. And under that picture, there was a caption that said, he heard 
his master's voice, listening to what he had to say. And so that's the way we are to be. We're to have a call to hear, to heed a consecrated ear. When we come to the Word of God, when we come to our worship services, not just tune out, but tune in. Tune in and hear the Word of God. Let the Spirit of God speak to us. And so, one of the ways to wisdom, the ways of wisdom, is to hear, to hear, to hear. The second way of wisdom is to have a clean heart. To have a clean heart. Verse 23, I read it earlier. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Watch over your heart. And again, this is a seed of our emotions. What is it that inflames us? What is it that disturbs us? What are our emotions like? Are they in line with the Word of God? What about our mental thoughts? What about our attitudes, our internal attitudes that we don't think anyone can see, but in reality, they can see them? And you say, well, how can they see my attitude? By our actions. They see all of our attitude attitudes by our actions. And so we are to have a clean heart. You've heard me speak about him before. We all have people that we've read behind, studied behind, and seen that they are spiritual giants to us and they stand out. And we remember some things in, their, in, in what they had to teach and say. A.W. Tozer has won for me. He, he's one of those. Tozer said, our task is to guard our heart. God will guide the universe. But our problem is, so often we let ourselves be absorbed with something that is far beyond us, our ability to control. God's saying, leave it alone. Leave it alone, all this COVID virus and all these worries and all these fears and all this burnum that, that's going on around us. And God is saying to us, listen, guard your heart. Don't feed on that kind of stuff. Guard your heart. God will guide the universe. And so the Bible says that we are to do what? Watch over your heart with all diligence. Why? Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Why? Because it says from it, from our heart, will flow the springs of life. It doesn't come from our head. It comes from our heart when we submit and keep it clean. And we do drink from it. You think you don't? Just walk away from the Word of God and see how quickly in my mind, in your mind, without even meaning to, it happens. We're saturated with the things of the world, the worries of the world, and the fears of the world, and the attitude of the world. And so our physical vitality, we've already talked about that, and our spiritual vitality comes from our heart. You see, whatever the heart loves, the eyes will see. We're only going to see what our heart loves. Anything else we'll really dismiss or count it as not important or we'll count it as the wrong thing. Because our eyes are seeing, seeing what we put in our heart. And that's all our ears can hear is what we have put in our heart. And that's all our eyes can see is what we put in our heart. That's why we need to be careful with television, books, magazines, all of these things that seem so simplistic and so well, it's just part of life. No, it's not. There are things that aren't supposed to be part of our life. You see, the Bible says our heart is a garden that needs gardening. Gardening. Now, gardening requires what? It requires very simply us guarding. We can't garden our hearts and bring forth the fruit that God wants it to have if we don't guard our heart. Look with me, if you will, in Matthew chapter 15. Just turn there, Matthew 15, and listen to what our Lord had to say. Matthew 15, verse 
Listen to what he said in verse 18 of Matthew 15. He said, But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from where? The heart, our mouth reveals our attitude, what we've been feeding on, what we've been thinking about. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart comes what? Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. And what the scripture is saying to us in Proverbs thousands of years before is they ought not be in our heart. And so we have to guard our heart. Of course, that only comes by the ability we've been given by Jesus through his spirit when he forgave us and gave us his presence living in us. But after we become Christians, his presence living in us while it has saved, while he has saved us, it doesn't change us. It is our ears being consecrated to him and our hearts being clean that allows change and changes everything. But Jesus went on to say, it's not about the physical. We can all appear to be so righteous on the outside. But Jesus said, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. It's not about well, I, I wash my hands. I'm clean of that. No, 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 no. That's not what it says. Now turn with me to Psalms, if you will. Psalm 24. Psalm 24. Now we'll begin reading verses 3 and 4. Verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Is, it is that which represents the presence of God. And it says, who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. So the Bible is telling us, who's really able to say, well, yeah, I'll walk in the presence of God. It's the person who does what? has a clean heart, who keeps his heart, who is willing to hear what God has to say. It's not about our likes or dislikes. Somebody says this, preacher says that, this person says that. Well, I don't like them, so I'm not going to listen to anything you've got to say. Well, that's fine. But listen to what God's got to say. And directly, this passage links our clean hands and clean hearts. You can't separate the two. The truth is that we do what we do because we are who we are. You see, our hands reveal our heart, and our heart reveals who we are. We do what we do because we are who we are. And so we are to guard this, guard this garden that God wants us to tend, which is the garden of our heart. Coleridge, the poet of yesteryear, had a friend come and visit with him, and they were talking. And this other friend said, you know, I believe that children ought to be given a free reign to think and to act at an early age and to make their own decisions. Coleridge listened to him as he talked, and when he finished, he said, come on, meet just a minute. And they stepped out into his backyard. He said, I want you to see my garden, my flower garden. And the man said, well, yeah, sure. And he went over there and he showed him a plot that was full of weeds, nothing but weeds. And the man said, that's nothing but weeds. What do you mean? That's nothing but weeds. And Colbert said, it was a rose farm of flowers. He said, but this year I let it grow as it willed. And that's what God's warning us about. We can't just let things come willy-nilly into our lives and grow at, with, with free will without us coming and saying, God, teach me how to guard my heart. Help me to pay attention to it. You see, 
with us as Christians, just as with gardens. We have to be cultivated, and God does that. He cultivates us. I remember again, Samuel Rutherford, a man of great wisdom. What was it that he said? He said, God desires a crop. Let him plow. Let him plow. And so God cultivates us, and we need to let him do that. And so, take care of the garden of our heart. The fruit of worship. Let's talk about that in a moment, for a moment. John 7, 38 says what? It says, it's out of our hearts that we worship. That's what Jesus said in, in John 7, 38. So, the condition we bring our heart, uh, or bring in our heart to the church and to listening to preaching, teaching, this kind of thing, the condition of our heart will determine whether we worship. Now, worship is not, okay, I'm present. I can check that duty off. Every time we have that opportunity, God is saying, I want to cultivate your garden. I want to cultivate your life. I have something beautiful I will make out of it. Listen to what he said in Psalm 45, 1. In Psalm 45, 1. The Bible says, My heart overflows with a good, th good thing. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is the, uh, is the pen of a ready writer. And so the fruit of worship grows out of a guarded heart. I didn't say the fruit of knowledge. I'm talking about wisdom. And wisdom always leads us to genuine worship. And the Bible is teaching us that the fruit of worship, okay, we come to church, we come to a Bible study. Well, what fruit is being able to be produced from that? It depends upon a consecrated ear. It depends upon a clean heart that is already present when we come and approach the Lord. You see, we can't let our heart go willy-nilly however we want to and listen to whatever we choose to during the week and then think that we're going to walk in on Sunday and be tuned to worship. It's not possible. It's not possible. And that's why so many times in our worship services and in our own lives, we don't praise God and worship Him the way we should. My heart overflows with a good theme, and it will when our ear is listening and when our heart is clean and we will address our praise to God, our King. And so we ought to be people of great joy, but we have to be prepared. When we come into a song service and an opportunity to praise God, we can't just come in and be like a day school. We have to be prepared beforehand to do that. Now, what do we with the garden of our heart determine? We determine how effective or ineffective the word of God is going to be in our lives. We're determining effectiveness by allowing our hearts to be cultivated by guarding our garden. Luke 8, 7 through 8. These are the words of Jesus. And other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. And other seed fell into the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. Is our soil good soil? Do we keep it where whatever seed that God's wanting to plant through his word takes root in our life and brings forth fruit? Jesus said, now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. And he goes on and he says, The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And as they go on their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures of this life. They didn't guard the heart. They didn't tend the garden and bring no fruit to maturity. And the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word and an honest and good heart. In other words, the soil is prepared and they guard their garden. They hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. 
since our hearts are gardens, we have to cultivate, we have to make sure that we do not allow the weeds to come into our lives and to take over. And the scripture tells us, guard your heart with all diligence. Guard your heart with all diligence. Sir Walter Raleigh, one of Britain's great sea captains in the days of uh, Queen Elizabeth I, he was a fearless explorer and adventurer, and he was a favorite of the queen. But after Elizabeth I was succeeded by James I, he disliked him with a great passion and hatred. James did, Sir Walter Raleigh. And in the end, he condemned Sir Walter Raleigh to death. And when he came to the executioner's block, the executioner had sympathy with him. And he said, sir, let me show you how to correctly position your head on the chopping block so that you will die without pain. And I will make it as comfortable as possible. And Sir Walter Raleigh said, it doesn't matter much, my friend. He said, whether or not the head is right, as long as the heart is right. That's true for all of us. And at times, that ought to break our heart looking at our heart. Looking at our heart through the eyes of God and His Word and letting Him apply it to our lives and reminding us, your ears not been tuned to me the way that it should be. And your heart has not been cleansed the way that it should be. You can't hear me correctly, nor can you act correctly and have the right attitude. And God is saying to us, okay, let's take care of that, and then we can go. Then your garden can grow. Then you can become all that I intended for you to become with your life. You see, the heart has to be right if our life is going to be right and righteous before God. And our heart can only be right if it's cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And you say, well, that's happened to me. I'm saying cleansed every day by the blood of Jesus and dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. Only then can the heart be kept with all diligence and care. And it needs to be protected. And one of the ways the New Testament tells us to do that is not just by our, again, well, I'm determined I'm going to do this. No, we protect that and we bring that about, a hearing ear and a clean heart. We bring it about by dressing ourselves in the breastplate of righteousness, which is the word of God, a word of God. And so we're looking here at the way of wisdom, a prescription, if you will, for spiritual health. And the first thing that we have looked at today and come away with from the word of God is a direction that we need to pay attention to, a consecrated ear and a clean heart. They are important. They are vital. They are life itself. And when we turn to the word of God, we turn to a lifeline for life. A lifeline for life. I thank you for being here tonight. I remind you, please go to our website. Remember, there are many people, you may be fine today, but there are others who are struggling. There are others who, we have some of these needs that have been made known to us on our prayer list there. And there are others that you may know about that we don't. If you feel free and have been given permission to share that those with us, certainly do that. We ought to be people of prayer, lifting each other up. We want to continue to pray for some people that come to mind on that prayer list. I particularly, again, think about uh, Brother Chris and his family as they're in this transition period as his dad's walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I think of Brother Michael, his, his father's been in the hospital uh, and he needs to, the whole family needs us to pray for him and for them. It's a difficult time for his dad, for his family as they make adjustments. And so let's be in prayer for people like that. Know who they are, pray for them, call them up, encourage them, 
But I can tell you the greatest encouragement is telling them, listen, I wanted to let you know today as I called you, I've been in prayer for you, and I'm going to be in prayer for you. And can I pray with you now? You see, it's not just the pastor who, who should be doing that. I should. It's not just deacons who should be doing that, and they should. It's every believer, everyone who has been bought by the blood of Christ, and that's every one of us. None are excluded. And I thank you again for being with us tonight. Join us next week. We'll go further. We'll look at the same passage and go to some other verses in there. Thank you.